Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Bermade, president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. It is a pleasure to welcome you to our virtual American Congressional Exchange with Congressman David Joyce and Josh Gottheimer. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about uh, today's expectations and then um, ask the members to each say a little bit. And then we have a panel. And then if uh, we have some reporters still on the line with us, we'll probably have about 10 minutes left at the end for uh, some questions. So. Some of you may have noticed that these are kind of tough times for American democracy. Things are a little polarized, people are a little upset. And um, I think that the general public seems to believe that that's really the only spirit that you can find anywhere in Washington, DC. And while it is clear that we have a lot of work to do, our experience at the Bipartisan Policy Center is that there is still an abiding interest among many members of Congress to try to find out where there are opportunities to really find kind of principled evidence-based collaboration. Um, we have vindicated that idea through these American congressional exchanges. We've had 28 trips. We've done now about 10 virtual discussions, and we have had members from you know the far edges of both parties. This has not been uh, simply a bunch of constructive moderates talking to each other, um, but we also have constructive moderates. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I think today's uh, event really gives us the opportunity to speak to um, two members who are really leaders in both of their caucuses and trying to find ways to actually move policy forwards. There are kind of two ambitions behind the American Congressional Exchange. The first is the recognition that polarization or not, we have an incredibly diverse country with all kinds of different interests. And we have found that it is extremely useful for members of Congress to actually go and have a better understanding of what each other are up against. Um, Congressman Kilmer, who took one of these trips, uh, said thoughtfully that if you want to know where someone's coming from, it's kind of nice to know where they came from. And so we found that simply the opportunity for people to actually spend real time engaging with each other's constituents has been very helpful. And then the other idea is a little bit, um, it's the soft skills of politics. In any human endeavor, uh, trust tends to be an incredibly important component to actually getting work done. And we have found that these trips have actually, in some cases, created opportunities for members to have each other's texts and be able to flip messages saying like what the heck are your folks thinking or how do you do this or how do you do that and there's a little bit of a general understanding that we're kind of all in this together and those are the kinds of opportunities you simply can't get if you're sitting on tv cameras or in a even in a committee room so we have two members with us today we're going to talk about a topic that's very important to the nation very important to the bipartisan policy center which is access to broadband, particularly as it relates to the opportunities and necessity to rely more on telehealth. Um, that is, I think, more apparent now than we could have ever imagined. I'm gonna introduce our two members with a little more detail, um, ask them both to provide some opening thoughts, and then we will engage with our panel. So first up, Congressman David Joyce from Ohio 14th, which is the eastern suburbs and southern exurbs around Cleveland. It also includes a lot of rural Ohio, going all the way to the Pennsylvania border. Congressman Joyce grew up in his district. He had attended the University of Dayton. He served as a county prosecuting attorney. Like so many members of the House, he's on way too many committees, uh, including uh, probes, interior, financial services. He is also proudly a member of many of the most high profile kind of collaborative caucuses on the Hill. When it comes to the topic today, he is also really one of the leaders around issues of rural broadband. He wrote an exceptional article that we'll share with folks with Congresswoman uh, Abby Finkenauer. Uh, he is a member of uh, the Rural Broadband Caucus and co-sponsored HR 4283, which is the Broadband Interagency Coordination Act of 2019. So Congressman Joyce, welcome. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Next, and hopefully uh, online now, and if not, we will... Uh... I'm here. Oh, there he is. I had, an, I had a little tech issue, sorry, but... Uh, Just in time, Gottheimer, that's what we like to call you. Josh Gottheimer is in his second term. He represents the combination of also kind of suburban and rural counties in New Jersey, Bergen and Passaic, as well as rural Sussex and Warren County. Congress Gottheimer grew up in New Jersey, attended University of Pennsylvania, Harvard Law School, couple of different uh, roles in the private sector. I think most significant for today's discussion, uh, Josh was also a senior counselor to the chairman at the FCC. Um, 
he's hunkered down on the Financial Services Committee, where he is on three subcommittees, including a committee on diversity and inclusion. I think most people know that uh, Josh is a co-chair and leader of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. He was deemed the most bipartisan Democrat by the Luger Center. Um, these are not gentle things, as uh, the congressman would tell you. A lot of people think that collaboration is this kind of you know, genteel sport. It's pretty rough out there if you actually want to work across the aisle. And uh, we have a tremendous amount of respect, Josh, for your uh, resilience. I think as it relates to uh, issues around broadband, Congressman Gottheimer has hosted roundtables, worked with local mayors. We're going to hear from one today. And the House passed legislation that actually includes provisions that Congressman Gottheimer drafted. So the focus of today will be on rural broadband. I wanted to see if um, Congressman Joyce and Congressman Gottheimer, you might want to offer a few kind of initial thoughts. I will then introduce the four panelists and we will have a conversation. And maybe um, Congressman Joyce, so I'll kick it off with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the uh, info and intro and the opportunity to be here with all of you on this important discussion. Before we dive into everything, I want to take a moment and thank my friend <clears throat> and colleague, Congressman, Congressman Gottenheimer, I was going to say Congressman Josh Schneider, but it's Josh, you know, always, I'm sorry, Congressman Gottenheimer, but he's always Josh to me on the streets, so, for partnering with him on today's exchange. I'm proud to serve with him in the Problem Solvers Caucus and work alongside him to bridge the partisan divide that has unfortunately plagued Washington for far too long. One of the areas that's an ample opportunity for bipartisanship is the expansion of broadband services. Despite the uh, fact that Ohio is the seventh largest economy in the country, more than 300,000 Buckeye households lack access to high-speed internet, creating critical barriers for roughly 1 million Ohioans. The connectivity for kids to do computer-based homework and for adults to look for a new job or access online education or training programs simply doesn't exist in some parts of Ohio. This was brought home to me during this pandemic. And if you had asked me prior to the pandemic if I thought uh, broadband should have been part of the infrastructure package, I just said, no, it's a private thing. But certainly when you go out to McDonald's that are only drive-throughs and you see the parking lots packed with families getting downloading their homework and co-opting the Wi-Fi at the McDonald's or having to load up a van to go to the local uh, cooperative schools so that people could sit in the parking lot and download their homework, you begin to realize that access to fast, reliable internet services become increasingly necessary for gainful employment, educational programs, and pre pre <laughs> preparation for the kinds of uh, careers that we know will exist in the future. <clears throat> but that's something that we knew fell victim to COVID-19, which drastically increased urgency for congressional action to expand broadband access and reliability. This pandemic has vastly altered how people access their doctors. According to HHS, about 43% of health centers offered telehealth services in 2018. Now more than 90% of the facilities <clears throat> offer them and about half of the health center visits during the pandemic are virtual. I'm looking forward not only to hear from the stakeholders in Northeast Ohio, but also from Congressman Gottheimer's district about how we can be most effective in our efforts to expand broadband service, the underserved or the unserved. And so with that, I wanna conclude by thanking Dr. Medina, from Cleveland Clinic, Greg Davis uh, from Patriot at Home, Mayor Stars, and Shade Cronin from Zufall Health for contributing to this exchange, providing our, their valuable insight on this matter. Thank you. Congressman, really appreciate you uh, getting this off to a good start. And you know, I actually was not aware of folks having to drive to the school parking lots. I think that really brings home. You know, I have three kids virtual learning around here, and it's already a hot mess. And so I think that additional challenge would be hard to. Uh, take advantage of. So uh, Congressman Gottheimer, do you want to share some opening thoughts? Sure. Thanks, Jason. Uh, thank, and really thank you for doing this and for bringing so many people together all the time, which I know you do. As you mentioned, it's uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center really does just a phenomenal job. And I think that my uh, dear friend Dave Joyce would, would agree that we need more of this. And uh, I'm really glad that he reached out to me and said, would I like to join? Because uh, not only is uh, Congressman Joyce a great leader in, in uh, the House, but he's become a really good friend. And as he mentioned, a colleague on the Problem Solvers Caucus, we, we meet every single week, as you know, 25 Democrats and 25 Republicans, consistently to try to get things done. We've been very focused on getting a package done on COVID relief, which has been very frustrating for many of us. So I'm really, but I'm honored to have such a, a good partner uh, in uh, Dr. Joyce 
who you know who really does an, a great job and I hope the people of his district send him back. So I, I hope, Joyce, you don't mind me saying that, uh, but I, I'm gonna give that little plug in there. Um, and I would like to uh, recognize uh, Mayor Stars, who is from my district, from Knowlton, and who does, who's a, a phenomenal leader, and I'm really honored to have her, and Shade Cronin, who was the foundation director at Sioux Falls Health, uh, and uh, also really a, an important leader in taking care of folks in my district. Um, so thank you both for being here. Now, the American Congressional Exchange is deeply important work because I feel, and I think we all agree, that we need a little more civility, decency, and respect in our system and our political dialogue on both sides of the aisle and less partisanship and gridlock. Um, as was mentioned, Jason said, you know, that's a, a big part of my work in Congress and what I focus on is trying to find places we can agree instead of just zeroing in on the places where we disagree because, uh, of course, those are, those are the easy places. It's the hard part is actually sitting down and, and getting it done. And the 5th District and Ohio's 14th are definitely different, but, uh, you know, we've got a few similarities. Both of our districts reside just outside great American cities, his being Cleveland and mine being New York City, uh, where, of course, home to the great New York Giants, um, I think they're the Jersey Giants, of course, because they're in Jersey. You know, the location is in Jersey. But so it's, it's a great team. We're having a little bit of a tough year, um, but we came on strong yesterday. You know, both our districts have a swath of urban or suburban areas and then distinct rural areas as well, which is what we're here today to discuss. Um, you know, as a first world country and largest economy in the world, access to basic Internet should not be an issue. As Adele will tell you later, it's a certainly an issue. Part of trying to adapt in our current crisis has meant that many of our families and kids are working and learning from home much more than ever before. And our businesses are relying on high speed internet to communicate with clients and customers and to bring their teams together for meetings online. On top of that, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, members of our community have increasingly needed to use the internet to connect with their family and friends from a safe distance. And as Zufalls will tell us, receive healthcare through telehealth options. You know, this public health and economic crisis has exacerbated the problems that many communities who lack broadband have had to face for years now, including rural areas like Sussex and Warren counties here in the fifth district. Uh, and with, with, you know, as again, we'll hear from the mayor and from, from Zoo Falls, as well as underserved and unserved lower income communities across my district. With the school year in full swing and you know, my kids using a device like this many days a week, the pandemic has forced many schools to start classes remotely and connectivity issues can stand in the way. You might imagine how much of a gap that exposes if you can't get your healthcare or your education uh, online because the connectivity is not just is not there. Uh, Mayor Stars will tell you that it could take a half hour to download a 30 minute episode of a TV show uh, in her neighborhood, uh, no less actually get online for school. Uh, according to a study of Microsoft last year, 162 million people across the US are not using internet at broadband speeds. In 2018, nearly 17 million children lived in homes without high speed internet more than 7 million didn't have computers at home. So you might imagine how difficult that is to stream a live video of online instruction if that's the situation you're in. Children can effectively miss out on months of education causing incalculable damage to their development. Uh, and, and while our current difficulties won't last forever, we do need to work together and find solutions now because you don't, you know, this just exposes a problem that already exists. And if you consider your local economies, more businesses are relying on cloud-based information storage Many are moving to communication systems that require internet access. It's basically just the cost of doing business these days is you have to be connected. Everybody expects it. And you people wanna either order remotely or do business remotely. During a pandemic, it's exposed a huge vulnerability for businesses in our underserved uh, broadband areas. And with the right speeds and access, business owners can communicate with anybody all over the world, but without it, it exposes a huge problem. And of course, lastly, cost remains a barrier because connectivity costs are, um, are can be very expensive, especially in more rural areas where they tend to charge more uh, because there's less competition. Something that uh, Mayor and I have worked on quite a bit to try to get more infrastructure, but also get costs down and help all of our schools and our homes and our businesses. And something I saw at the FCC, as you mentioned, that I was there back in you know a decade ago was a huge issue and it remains a huge issue. It's why we fought to get bipartisan legislation to get more investment in broadband infrastructure. It's a piece of legislation I led and proud of because um, we need more investment in, in, in infrastructure programs and grant programs uh, like at the FCC to help more underserved areas. And I know David and I both fought for CARES to get the CARES Act passed in, in March and become law, which includes obviously a lot of investment to increase broadband infrastructure and connected devices to support telehealth, telework, and telelearning. 
including resources for Zoo Falls in my district um, with locations in Newton and Hackettstown. So I'm looking very much looking forward to this conversation and with a great partner um, who is a, a really a phenomenal legislator and I'm so honored to be here with him today. So thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you, Congressman. So uh, my privilege now to um, introduce our four experts and then ask them to each say a few words that will get us going for a conversation. I will note having spoken a lot about education because I think Josh and I are both uh, suffering this uh, on a daily basis on behalf of our kids. I think what we really want to focus on um, in much of this conversation is healthcare, which really prior to um, the pandemic even was I think the critical question around for many people access to broadband and telehealth. Uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center has a rural health task force and we really concluded that this is the key to making healthcare efficient and accessible and equitable. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, partners at the Helmsley Trust who have been terrific. And you know, just the stat I will uh, mention is uh, what really compelled me was in the uh, urban area, there are about 260 specialists for every 100,000 people. And in rural areas, it's about 30. And that doesn't even include the frontier areas, which is really, I think, uh, another conversation that we need to have as a country. So we have four great speakers. Uh, I'll do quick introductions and then ask them to say a few words. Gregory Davis is the founding member of Patriot at Home, which is a home healthcare company located in Northeast Ohio. Shade Cronin, uh, as uh, Congressman Gottheimer mentioned, is with Zufall Health Foundation. They are a federally qualified health center serving about 30,000 patients in Northwest and Central New Jersey. Adele Stars is the mayor of Knowlton Township, which is a rather rural community of about 3,000 in Northern New Jersey. She has made access to better internet a key focus of her tenure in office. And finally, uh, Adele Stars, I'm sorry, I just jumped over to person else. Uh, Michelle Medina, who is the Associate Chief of Clinical Operations at the Cleveland Clinic. Some of you may have heard of the Cleveland Clinic. They are providing incredible amounts of meaningful public information for folks in terms of how to live our lives during this pandemic. Um, Michelle is the head of operations on a wide suite of issues, but particular to this conversation, she has responsibility for home medical services as well as wellness services. So um, maybe if we can just go in that same order and just ask each of you to say a few words and then we'll get into a conversation. Um, Greg, do you wanna lead off? Sure, absolutely. So Jason, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Joyce. Congressman Gottheimer, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, just a brief summary of who Patriot is. Um, we provide um, skilled home health care um, in the north, 16 Northeast Ohio counties. So Congressman Joyce, we kind of overlap your district pretty pretty much. Um, we're, our main hub is in Youngstown. I, go, I live in Hudson and we basically cover everything in between. Um, not only do we have skilled home health care, which provides nurses and therapists and social worker to people's homes, but I also own a visiting physician practice as well. Um, so we send physicians into people's homes and provide primary care service as well. Um, so we have a unique perspective. Um, obviously, the COVID uh, pandemic provided a lot of unique challenges to us all, but specifically in healthcare, care, um, we were definitely cut on our heels with um, PPE with testing, which the Cleveland Clinic was instrumental in, in basically pioneering nationally, which was fantastic. Um, but it forced us as an organization serving 16 Northeast Ohio counties to really take a fledgling, fledgling telehealth program and put it on hyperdrive. Um, we learned on the fly. Um, I'm not gonna say we mastered it, but um, we, we learned it rapidly. Um, and we learned some things along the way. Um, there's a lot of power in telehealth. It does not replace each and every visit that we send, um, but it, it certainly is a great adjunct and can replace a lot of visits that we do. Um, what are the advantages to the system and the Medicare system? Well, one is cost. Um, you know, a telehealth visit is much, much less expensive because a staff member can do many, many more telehealth visits versus a in-home visit where they actually get in their car and go, you know, 15, 20, sometimes 40 miles away and deliver, deliver health care. Um, and we can provide more touches per day. So that same healthcare worker, instead of seeing six or seven patients per day, can see 20, 25 patients a day. So you can see the power, the cumulative power in that as well. Um, some of the barriers that we see with telehealth, there's a couple of them, and, and you know, you all talked about one of them. It, it's broadband access. Um, I have some stats that I, I can cite later, but you know, there's a lot of our seniors that don't have um, broadband access. 
there's a lot of um, that uh, demographics that don't have it, you know, socioeconomically, it, there's a direct correlation between socioeconomics and, and, and not having um, broadband access. Um, secondly, hardware. With telehealth, obviously you have to have a hardware platform to facilitate the telehealth visit. Um, that can be a, a barrier as well. Um, and the biggest barriers we face, and this is um, something that, that Congress uh, can help with, is reimbursement. Specifically in my area of one of my businesses with, with home health, um, there's about 12, over 12,000 skilled home health uh, companies in the United States of America with hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers delivering millions of visits annually. And unfortunately, with the CARES Act, um, skilled home health was not uh, given reimbursement for, for telehealth. So that's certainly something we could, we could uh, put our sights on as well. So again, I appreciate the opportunity. I am open to any and all questions as well. So thank you all so much. Greg, you, uh, you kicked on, I think, what a couple of the big conversations we're going to have. So thank you. Great. So, um, thank you. Shay, do you want to share a little bit about the Zoo Fall experience? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. And thank you, Congressman Joyce and, and Congressman Gottheimer for having me as part of the conversation today. Um, as Jason said, Zufal is a federally qualified health center. Um, we actually have about 40,000 patients a year now, about 143,000 visits. Uh, we provide primary medical, dental, and behavioral health services. Um, about 85% um, of our patients are under 250% of the federal poverty guidelines. So we serve a very uh, needy group of folks in, in New Jersey. Um, we cover, Zufal it covers the, the broadest geographical um, coverage in New Jersey of all the FQHCs that are here. We have some more suburban clinics, and then we have in Congressman Gottheimer's district, two of our more rural clinics in Hackettstown and Newton. Um, we also pivoted very quickly to telemedicine um, during COVID. Uh, none of us had much of a choice. Uh, we had started to do a bit of telemedicine in our behavioral health area prior to COVID, uh, but I think our, our providers would say we did in, in two weeks what we had per planned to do over about two years um, with, with telemedicine, and we're grateful that, that we've been able to do that. Um, and I think, you know, we have found that, um, that the, the, our patients that really need telemedicine the most are the ones that have the most difficulty accessing it, whether it's because they lack broadband access, whether they are a senior in public housing that doesn't understand how to connect to Zoom or doesn't have um, a smartphone or a computer. Um, we, we work with a number of special populations. We work with people living with homelessness, both on the street and in, um, in shelters. We work with residents of public housing, many of whom are seniors. Uh, we work with migrant and seasonal farm workers. A lot of times folks don't think of New Jersey and that, or, or even more Southern Jersey, but, but we do have a number of, of farming communities in, in Northwestern Jersey that we work with, um, and we work with veterans as well. So all folks that have difficulty connecting and accessing the healthcare system on a good day, and then you overlay the pandemic and, uh, and the challenges are even greater. So uh, again, the lessons we've learned from, from working with telemedicine during the pandemic really will extend um, as we get back to um, whatever our new, our new normal existence is. Our patients have challenges coming into the health center uh, because of transportation. Um, I'm, I'm sure Mayor Stars may touch on this, but we have, we have difficult transportation in rural Northwest New Jersey. Um, you know, folks accessing the bus, the, there's, there's lacking trains. Um, our, our patients are working a couple of jobs. They have children. So taking a day off of work to come to the health center, they don't get paid um, if they have to do that. And, and they don't necessarily have someone to watch their children while that happens. So telemedicine offers certainly many advantages um, to our patients, again, even in, in non-pandemic times. Um, but we do see the challenges of lacking uh, broadband coverage. We see it even in our health centers. Our, our health center in, in Hackettstown loses internet coverage all the time. And that's a challenge when you're working with electronic medical records, which we are grateful to have. But, uh, but it's a challenge when you can't you know, connect to the server and access those patient records. We, we have two mobile vans as well that we take out, um, both to homeless sites, um, to shelters, to our farms, and we need, we need connection with that too. We need connectivity to get uh, patients registered, get access to their, to their medical records. So I'll stop there for the moment. Um, again, we appreciate being part of the conversation today um, and look forward to some questions to come, but thank you. Thank you very much, Shade. So um, Mayor Stars, share with us a little bit about uh, Knowlton Township. 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first, let me just say thank you as well to Congressman Gottheimer and Congressman Joyce for putting this together, and especially to Congressman Gottheimer for continuing to fight for our town. You know, he and I are of different political parties, but we agree that this is the issue that everybody can come together on. Um, and we've been working for a while in Knowlton. Knowlton is about 60 miles from New York City, so you wouldn't think that we have these kinds of issues, but we do. The digital divide definitely is the biggest issue that Knowlton has been facing this year. And the pandemic has just sort of brought that home. Most of our residents get their internet through um, telephone lines through DSL and a few lucky ones get it through cable, but that's less common. Um, about two years ago, we were able to take advantage of a federal CAF grant to get a local provider to install improvements in the town, but it only went to about one third of us. And those of us who weren't, didn't, weren't able to benefit from it um, continue to have major impacts to our households and to our businesses. And so for families, it means you can't live stream. Um, I have four children. They cannot all be on Zoom at the same time, which means if they have an assignment that needs to be uploaded, I have to take them to the library, which is only open one day a week, by the way, because of COVID, in order to upload assignments there. For businesses, it means our farmers cannot use remote sensing for um, their field or greenhouse conditions. For our healthcare, it means we have a lot of healthcare professionals in Knowlton, and it means that they cannot conduct uh, telehealth calls from their homes. They're most often going into their cars because the connection drops so frequently in their homes. And obviously, if the call is dropping all the time, that really makes it impractical for that to, to continue. Um, and of course, our realtors is another big issue. They often cite the poor internet as a reason why prospective buyers choose other towns. Um, I think that the solution is not so much technological, but it's really economic. Um, it's just not cost effective for internet companies to reach many rural areas. And that's why I really think that intervention is necessary to, under to underwrite uh, the funding of fiber optic cable. And there are a couple of ways that I hope we can discuss today where the federal government specifically uh, can provide assistance. So one of them would be underwriting that cost of fiber optic cable. A second would be um, updating the federal census block maps, which are inaccurate and often show areas as having good coverage when in fact they don't. And a third is possibly changing the cutoff for these federal CAF grants, which is the means by which many towns get improvements in service. Uh, right now, it's structured so that towns that have no service can get these federal CAF grants, but that still leaves the rest of us with really poor service without any improvements. But I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak for Knowlton on this issue, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. That's terrific. Really appreciate you being with us. So last, certainly not least, um, Dr. Medina, please uh, share some thoughts from the Cleveland Clinic. Good afternoon, can you all hear me? And just so I, I completely agree with what everybody has said already. And just so you know, my daughter actually had to help me with the Zoom call as well. We use Microsoft Teams at the clinic. So it's not something that I do every day, but thank you for having me. Uh, uh, Jason, Congressman Joyce, Congressman Gottheimer, thank you again for convening this. Um, I think a, a lot of the people on the panel have already touched on a lot of the practical things that we see every day and certainly the barriers that the people that we interact with are faced with every day. Um, so. My role, I feel, at least towards the end of this conversation, is to just give a sense of um, the problem that the Cleveland Clinic and a lot of other healthcare organizations are thinking through, which is how do you actually achieve all of these things at scale, right? For us to be able to solve small problems in local communities is wonderful and really is where it begins. But I think all of us really want to look at the big picture and think about how do you solve these, these problems at scale. And even before COVID hit, um, a lot of organizations like mine have really been thinking about how do we get to a point where care is accessible, affordable, really addresses the appropriateness of healthcare use, and also brings about the right health outcomes that we want with the appropriate patient experience. And certainly so many people have been playing with telemedicine, but as um, Shade pointed out, COVID is the true accelerant. We learned so much just by switching very quickly, not always clean, a lot of it was messy, but we learned a lot um, in that process. 
Um, I'd like to actually just give an example of, of one of the things that I think is important for us in healthcare to bring to the table, which is to show you that telemedicine actually works and telemedicine actually works in the way that it can um, impact a lot of people um, with, with the smallest um, sort of investment in terms of scale um, and to do it in a way that actually brings all of our best folks together. So Greg talked about sort of the testing program that the clinic has around COVID and it is true. We have actually tested, I think the majority of the folks who live in Cuyahoga County and surrounding counties just because of the infrastructure that we built. And one of the things that we recognized very early was that in order to make testing um, um, relevant, we actually have to follow up on these patients and understand what's happening with them um, after they've tested positive. And so very early in the pandemic, we actually put together a whole monitoring program. And to date, we have monitored over 7,500 patients who have tested COVID positive in our area. Um, to put that in perspective, Cuyahoga County has about 12,500 cases. So we really have been pretty much instrumental in making sure a lot of people in our area are COVID positive, stay well. And one of the things that we introduced was technology, right? Because we need to be able to actually get to folks and understand what's happening with them. And so we introduced ways by which they can actually interact with us through an app that allows them to tell us what is happening with them. And by doing so, we can receive very early signals of how they are doing at home. And by receiving those very early signals, Greg, exactly what you're doing, send somebody to the home, figure out how we can help them virtually, make sure that they have everything that they need so that hopefully they don't get worse and end up in the hospital. And we have seen really good outcomes with that, good outcomes enough that we've actually shown that if they interact with us for about 10 days, the risk of them getting admitted actually comes down by about seven and a half percent. So that's the promise of telemedicine. And by learning from that, and it's not just about, as you pointed out, Adele, the technology, it really is about how you bring the entire system together, how people work together, and hopefully how you make this um, accessible, but also frictionless, right? Because folks who are at home thinking about their kids and how they're going to put food on the table don't necessarily want to think about one other thing. And so how do you make this frictionless and then have a safety net to just in case they are not able to access us through technology, there's a way to actually make everything else work. And one of the things that's pretty clear to us, when we look at our um, outlying communities, uh, Congressman Joyce, all the way to Lake Ashtabula, on the west side when we go out to Lorraine County and so forth, the signal drops off. Our ability to actually have patients really participate and benefit from these types of programs really drop off significantly. I wanted to bring that to the table just again to bring it home and bring it very real um, to folks here that accessibility is probably just the baseline thing that we have to think about as we lay down the infrastructure for um, broadband technology. So thank you. Thank you all. So we now have about 15 or 20 minutes for a conversation. I really want to turn it over to the congressman as much as possible, but just to lay down the challenge. So this is the most obvious idea that hasn't happened for a decade, right? The National Governors Association almost every single year, as far as back as I can remember, has made broadband access in both rural and urban areas a, a national priority. You know, if our houses were flooding before, now they were flooding with a tsunami. So what's it going to take? You know, Congressman, how can we, um, how can we as a kind of a community of people who care about this uh, help you advance the agenda? Joyce, you're wiser and been there longer, and so you go ahead. <coughs> you can see how good I am. That he just shut us off. So fine, time. fine, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a. Uh... You know, it's, it's something that really was driven home to me in during all this pandemic, as I said before. And so I think it's something that you know, even uh, HHS and, and President Trump signed an executive order uh, <clears throat> to expand telehealth. And uh, one area I can also tell you, I see a lot of it is uh, I've also, because of my time as a prosecutor here, saw the opioid addiction as being a real problem. And so all of a sudden, we've done all this good work to try to bring those numbers down. And unfortunately, in this pandemic, it's starting to go back up. So on two different panels that I was on, one for uh, the opioid uh, people and, and our folks who are working with that problem, and then also the mental health folks, saying that this has really been helpful to them to have people uh, at least have, uh, you know, some people don't want to reach out for mental health reasons because they don't want to go into a clinic or go in to see a doctor. So the ability of them to finally have the, uh, reach out and be able to have a connection with somebody can help walk them through the issues 
and, and you know, save them and, and save people from getting back on the opioids, God, that, you know, that's a tremendous help that should sell itself. Unfortunately, we, we um, uh, although Josh and I have worked very hard on trying to bring some common sense to a deal uh, that everybody can agree on and help America, because when we first planned all this stuff at the end of March and had two bipartisan deals there, we figured we we're gonna be in this for six weeks. And now we are seven months in, in, in moving in another uh, panel Josh and I were on uh, last week or so with the CEO from Goldman Sachs. He's predicting this doesn't turn until the second or third quarter of next year. And so obviously the, you know, we're doing the work that we need to do now is to make sure that they at least have the skeletal framework in place so all of you can be able to access your patients and access your clients and you know, kids can access school and everything else so they have that outreach available. But from the inside, Josh, having worked there, may have a better idea on what it is that we need to do to get that accomplished. No, no I think, David, you brought up a great, multiple great points here. I mean, one, we're obviously seeing it, and Greg, you made this point. I'm, I'm grateful for your remarks as well as yours, Michelle, because you know, the idea on the health side, there's a lot of skepticism about how telemedicine could work you know obviously it's been working in many parts of the country for a long time but i think from a broader sense a lot of parts of the country just weren't utilizing it and now have had to and you know this is where the reimbursement point is so important and you, you see that it can work and well i was at a, a a clinic last week and you know we see the uh, especially for the on the counseling side there were skeptics who said this couldn't work and We've got nothing but positive feedback. In fact, it was in Dallas, Sussex County, you know, uh, a place that provides so much help for for those recovering and and seeking treatment. And it's they've been doing a phenomenal job. And we were up at um, I was in this other part of my district at a veteran at a CBOC at a clinic with veterans on the mental health side. David, to your point, and where also there was there's there's been a lot of hesitation especially for post nine, you know, for, for pre 9-11 veterans about mental health services online. And, you know, the, so, but there's been no other choice. And it's, I think people are getting used to it and realizing that it can be a solution and we, we have to find ways to help people. So I think we've really seen the benefit of it, but it raises a specter of the fact that if you can't get online, uh, as Adele said, and we're having, if there's, if her four kids try to get on at the same time, it's impossible and you got to go to the library. Well, that doesn't work. Um, uh, all the time when you need these services. So to the, to, to the point, uh, Jason, I think going to the next Congress, depending upon you know, what the makeup is and who wins, I, I think regardless, infrastructure will be probably, if, if there's not a, it would likely be a COVID package, um, and then infrastructure, uh, I believe, will, will likely be, especially if, if uh, Vice President Biden wins, I think probably be the, the first major package. And, and when we think about infrastructure, these days, I, you know, it's it's not just roads, bridges, and tunnels. You know, uh, broadband is a, a key part of that infrastructure of any infrastructure package. It has to be. And as you know, the maps that we have of where broadband coverage is are way out of date. Um, I, you know, we don't really use the fact that we don't have a good mapping system. We map everything else in this country. You know, you get into we hit waves in your car. I'll take you anywhere and tell you where to go. Yet we still don't really know where there's good competition on broadband. Where there's Good pockets and 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 pockets that that uh, are have competition. Those that don't. And if we're going to funnel certain resources, you don't want to overbuild in the places that already have it and put more resources in places that do. You really want to focus those resources on the uh, on the parts of America that have been left out. Um, and and I think that's been part of the challenge is the resources haven't gone to the right places. Um, we you know we did this with telephone years ago, as you know, as a as a country, we we connected people. We decided that this was going to be a major priority for the country that you had to actually have service, right? That's why you pay a fee on your, on your phone bill every month um, to help connect those who don't have, uh, can't afford it or, or the cost of having to build that to a rural area. I think we've got to consider the same thing for, for rural America and for the underserved. You, you have to figure, even, you have to figure out a way to bring broadband to everybody or those places will literally be left out. And so that, that's my thinking. And I'm really hoping that this is a great area of bipartisanship because uh, there always has been in this area with infrastructure in, in the early next Congress. Question to as our the panel. Go ahead, as David. As a co nursing caucus, I could tell you that, uh, as Dr. Medina has certainly said, that there's a primary care shortage. Uh, anyhow, it's hard to attract people out to Ashtabula or along the Pennsylvania area. And so, and Greg, you made a great point of it that uh, I completely forgot about, but the ability for 
you to use limited resources with your staff to be able to make that many more touches because they don't have to drive to different locations that they can actually reach people. I mean, that in of itself should be a selling point. I can't help but notice that my screen says David Joyce's network bandwidth is low. So just, uh, you know, <laughs> apropos of nothing. Um, a question to share with our panelists. I think we've all talked a little bit about behavioral health and clearly there are significant opportunities there, but a few have also mentioned some of the limitations. And I'm just wondering if anyone can speak to some of the questions around kind of diagnostics at home and whether you can imagine some of the primary healthcare issues actually also not requiring in-person connectivity. I can, I can start. Um, so this is something we wrestle with every single day because we still have probably about 25 to 30 percent of the visits that we do currently, certainly not the 80 percent, 90 percent that we were doing in March are still conducted virtually. And, and we view it with an eye towards, are we doing the right thing by the patient? Are we not causing harm? Are we making sure that they are, we are actually evaluating um, appropriately and making sure they get the right care? So that is something that we think about every day. Um, certainly some things can augment that. One great example, and again, I'm gonna point to Greg because I think you may have had some experience as well with this, is when we think about our frail homebound individuals, that are also managed by a primary care group. We call them their medical care at home. They're actually primary care providers who take care of a number of people who are um, homebound. Um, we have developed a program where we dispatch um, paramedics that we have brought into our team, especially if the initial either phone or video evaluation does not point to something um, that either needs to be admitted or go to the emergency room um, right away, but certainly needs a little bit more in-person evaluation. And so that is one way that we have actually extended the bandwidth, as, as Congressman Joyce has pointed out, we, don't, we are not gonna have enough primary care providers for everybody in this country, it continues to be a shortage, but using different members of our team a little bit more appropriately in that way and really getting to their top of competency, they can certainly go out, they can evaluate, they can start treatments right away if we feel that they need to have an IV line pushed or a, a specific antibiotic injection, and then be able to actually connect back with home base through a video connection, and they carry around portable um, tablets, and then be able to actually speak directly to the provider and then be able to actually connect with the patient and the family. That does not happen without obviously a good broadband connection, right? We can only extend ourselves so much, but when we get there, we need to be able to do that. The other thing I want to bring up is the, the possibility of us to actually connect with other community members. So uh, we have a program where we actually have uh, clinical services being delivered within schools. And as the schools rethink their infrastructure now, making their systems you know, more COVID appropriate, I suppose, those are the conversations we're having. What does it mean to actually have healthcare in the schools so that parents don't have to pick them up, take them actually to an office to be able to get their immunizations or to be able to get their care and have it happen there. And in fact, one of the exciting things, and Adele, I think you mentioned you had an interest in asthma. One of the exciting things that we, that we wanna do with one of our local districts is to be able to empower the child, the school coach, the school teacher, the school nurse, for all of them to understand how to take care of a child's asthma and then be able to connect to each other remotely so that wherever that child is, they're at school with the school nurse in a sporting event where they're with the coach, all of them have an understanding through one app what is happening to that child. It's a promise, it's something that we're trying to build, um, but these are the ways that technology can make the care um, much more comprehensive and also frictionless. So before we open this up to the few reporters on the line, I just wonder if the other three panelists, um, we don't get this opportunity all the time to have a couple of members of Congress on the spot, bipartisan, so obviously they can all get it done. In addition to money, 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 which of course we know, I mean, I think our estimate was about $80 billion might be needed to really do this together. Anything else you want to ask the members of Congress to think about as they go into what I'm sure will be a dynamic legislative lame duck? David's happy to take all the tough questions. Shade or Adele or Greg, anything you want to make sure that we're thinking about in addition to yeah, just funding? I, I, I would say this, um, just globally, um, I think that community-based care, um, you know, obviously right now there's a light shined upon it just because of the COVID pandemic. But I think I just want the members of Congress to understand the capabilities we truly have at home. 
um, you know, um, not just highlighted during the pandemic, but just with increased technologies, whether they be, um, you know, telehealth, which we're talking about today, multiple different medical modalities, ventilators at home, um, just keeping in mind that we have very advanced capabilities and more technologies coming out each day that can support patients at home that can really, really um, help the patients because obviously they can stay home. But secondly, um, it, it's much cheaper for the system as well. And I, and I don't think truly, honestly, um, in, in the healthcare lobby that um, home-based care gets a lot of love. <laughs> so for a variety of different reasons, but you know, I would certainly love to expand upon this. I know this isn't the setting, but um, at, at, a, at a later time, given the opportunity. Really important insight. I think we share it strongly. Um, I, I would build a little bit on what, what Greg is saying. You know, at, at Zufo, we take care of a lot of folks with chronic illnesses, um, diabetes, for example. And I think it's one way that um, we found using telemedicine that, again, in, in looking at savings to the overall system, um, both to the patient and to the system, and, and I'm sorry, Jason, it, it does sort of often come back to money. I'll try not to go too close there, but um, but we, we have looked at, um, at how we can augment even the telemedicine visits. We're doing some pilots with sending patients um, home with, with some home kits, so um, glucometers to measure their blood sugar, a blood pressure monitor, a scale um, to measure weight, and so that when our, our providers are meeting with them through telemedicine, and, and hopefully that's a video visit, but it's not always, and sometimes it's over the phone, um, but that, that our providers have more data so that they can better assess the patient and better track them. Um, we saw the, the A1Cs um, you know, measuring di diabetes um, going up in, amongst our patients during COVID. And that's not a good thing, right? We, we leave that unmanaged. Um, that leads to, to problems down the road, more difficult for the patient, more expensive for the system. So if we can find additional ways to um, get that additional data from the patients, um, their, their satisfaction goes up. Um, they are not missing work for an appointment. Their transportation issues, their childcare issues are less. Um, we're improving their access to care and with the goal of improving their health outcomes, right? So better outcomes, lower cost for the system. Um, but I will say um, that, that reimbursement is really critical. Um, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement, 50% of our patients are uninsured also, and those folks often get forgotten. So I would put in a plug to, you know, to continue to, to remember those folks that, are, that have no coverage whatsoever. And sometimes that's more of a state issue than a federal issue, um, but it's really important that those folks have access to these services because if, um, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that all of our health is really intertwined. And so that we need to find a way to make sure that all members of our community have, have access. Mayor, a, a final thought from the panel? Can I just add one thing to that? I think Shade makes a very important point, which is, and, and I, I know David who, you know, um, shares about seven different uh, caucuses, you know, um, ones relating to addiction and treatment and recovery and, and, and ones on, on Great Lakes and you name it, he's got his hand in it. I think what an area that's that's so important, Shay, to your point, there is a there's a resource question, but all these things are very closely tied together in the sense that if if we don't um, think about all of this in a different way, and I, I guess that's what what I think COVID has enabled us to do. Obviously, it's been a continued to be a health and economic crisis for our country and a devastating one on, for so many of our families. It's also made us have to reorient ourselves. On, and, and rethink the way we're used to doing things, right? And, and, and I'm just grateful that many of you have, uh, like Zoo Falls have adapted, you know, you've had to adapt, like it or not. And I know that that's happened with so many of our communities, people just had to adapt to this world. And in that process, I think has exposed a huge vulnerability, uh, which is where we are on broadband, right? I and mean, this is, this has made it clear that if we can't fix this, it's sort of a core building block for all these other pieces that are, are attached to it. So, you know, if, if you, you can't do the health piece and the, and the business piece and the school piece and all these other pieces of our, of this new society, unless you have, uh, unless you have basically broadband, unless it's, it's as, as fundamental as, right, turn on the electricity. Because if you don't have, if you don't have it, all these other pieces won't work. And then you have parts of our society that are literally left out or in a weaker spot than the other people. And that to me is unacceptable, which is why 
we, many of us are coming together to fight for this. That's why we've got some resources in the CARES Act, but really a lot of this is longer term. You're not going to fix it in a month. It's going to take years to really start building and rethinking of it as a, a true infrastructure challenge in our country. And, you know, I just want to thank Joyce for, for uh, Congressman Joyce, excuse me, for his, for his leadership in, in doing so, because I, I think that's where we're going to have to find the bipartisanship. And I think next Congress, you're going to see us come together because Democrat or Republican, you've seen this as a challenge for your district, right? Like there's no hiding it. And, and, and I think that's been pretty clear. Sure, we have a little time for the reporters, but uh, Mayor, do you want to hear some final thoughts? Just one thing that, that occurred to me um, on the finance piece is that I think we're all thinking about the good thing about internet, I think, is that we can get it to American households in a lot of ways. It doesn't just have to be through the telephone company. And so what that means is that the cost could be shared. And I hope that that's the way that Congress will, will take a look at this problem. You know, it can come through satellite. It can come through, you know, your cell phone company. It can come through your cable company. It can come through your phone lines. And I think if we distribute that cost evenly, that maybe, um, you know, it's a, a problem that can be overcome. So I believe we have a few reporters on the line here. I don't know if anyone is uh, interested in asking a question or if you're a, a shy or is yours? Cool. Uh, hi, uh, thanks so much for holding this conversation. This was really interesting. Um, I'm Nicholas Blue with USA Today. And I had a question for um, the two members on the line about uh, kind of the broader picture here. I mean, we're talking about uh, broadband, but you know, all this relates to the central question on coronavirus. So, um, you know, we have this artificial deadline coming up to reach a deal by tomorrow on relief. Uh, do you think that a deal will be struck, and if not, why? Where do you want to go first? Oh, feel free, Josh. Um, thank you. It's too bad your broadband's going out. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll say thanks. Thanks for the question. It's, I think it's critically important. I think David and I, I, I believe, are, are probably in a similar place on this, which is that it's unconscionable that it not get done. Um, and and frankly, you've got people who are. Uh, continue to suffer. I think we are in, you know, and uh, from both from on the health side where we need more testing and support and obviously on the economic side where we've got to get more s stimulus to our families and support for our small businesses. And, and you've got everyone from, from restaurants who I was just with a, a family last week, who's, whose restaurants on the verge of going out, but that's the story in New Jersey of a lot of, a lot of our small businesses and a lot of our down, you know, a lot of our downtowns. And I know Adele, uh, Mayor Stars, has the same same issue with, with with businesses she just told me about the other day. So to not, you know, we, we can't wait until February. It's unacceptable. And I worry that if we don't get something done, uh, whether it's in the next 48 hours or whatever the date is before the election, it must get done because we can't afford to wait. Um, and we're very, you know, my understanding is given the numbers and as you know, the Problem Solvers Caucus put out a proposal um, a month ago that helped get uh, both sides back to the table. That was a framework that, you know, I think helped uh, restart the conversation embraced by, in aspects by both sides. And I, I think the fact is we said it was, we were hoping between one and a half trillion and uh, it's one and a half and two trillion. We're, we're right there, that one, one, eight, eight. The question of course are the priorities of what's, we, we're not, we don't have all the details of all of, of where the, the disagreements are um, underneath in the language. But the bottom line is I'm hoping they stay at the table, the negotiators stay at the table and, and given how close we are um, and get it over the line. Now, I'm, lastly, I'm hoping I saw uh, Senator McConnell has said that he would consider whatever package we sent over. I hope he's right about that. You know, he's in the last weeks, he's, he said he would he refused to bring it. Then now he's willing to consider it. Um, because if, if to just come up with an agreement and then not be able to get it through the Senate would also be uh, un unacceptable. So we got to get all parties just to, to agree, get this done now. One of the things I'll say is that, <clears throat> you know, and Josh is experiencing now being the majority, we certainly had it when we were Republicans when Paul Ryan dropped this uh, health care plan from above with no input from members in five days to, to vote on it. I mean, it, that's, that's the bullshit of all this. If you let the people who sit down at the table like we did during problem solvers, uh, the meetings that went on and on and came to that one and a half trillion. It wasn't easy and both sides had to make concessions. But at the end of the day, it was a deal. 
you know, it was something that people could work with. Uh, and it's just a shame that right now there's 135 billion in PPP money sitting there. Could be repurposed and reallocated. There's money for the Main Street Lending Program or the Economic Injury Disaster Program. There's deadlines that we put in place, again, premised upon this being a six week thing that's now in its seventh month, where I'm reading here in the local papers, counties and in, in, uh, municipalities trying to spend money to meet the deadline and not spending it on like COVID testing or the things that are really important. Out here, they were talking about buying 10 snow plows on the IFCOM people have to get to the hospital and they're trying to justify the money they're spending. And it's just wrong. We should be able to take this money, bring it, you know, people give it back, <laughs> repurpose and retool the money for the things that really need to get done. Broadband uh, being one of those type of things to make sure that, God forbid, we ever have to go through this again, that everyone in this country is prepared for. Our package had broad, you know, what we proposed had broadband in it. Mm -hmm for a reason, and I think today's conversation just reinforces why. Right, time for one or two final questions, depending on how late the members are willing to be to their next 1.30 appointment. Anybody else online? Set. You're right on time and right on schedule, just like the Congress. Um, so uh, representatives, um, no, look, really appreciate you taking the time for this discussion. I think not only is the substance important, but the the simple fact of it is important. I think it is the spirit of these kinds of discussions, just as Congressman Joyce said, that actually are the firmament of a deliberative process, which is the way our democracy works. And uh, we are still pretty bullish on the long arc of American democracy, recognizing it's gonna be a couple of rough weeks, but um, really appreciate what the both of you are doing. And I wanna thank all of our panelists and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation um, probably very early next year. Yeah, so you should be very bullish. We live in the greatest country. You should be very bullish. So thanks. Thank and plus, we got Joyce here. We're good to go. Uh, Adele, <laughs> thank you. Greg, Michelle, Shay, thank you all very much. Jason, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you.